This video is about cross product. It's just our first introduction to cross product. Um, the cross product of two vectors is denoted by u cross v. Um, and it's a product that yields another vector. Um, our dot product, it always gave us a scalar, so sometimes we would call that a scalar product. Cross product always gives us a vector, so sometimes we call this a vector product. The algebraic definition of dot product, or excuse me, of cross product, is this. Um, probably the easiest way to find the cross product of two vectors, uh, where the vectors are in three-dimensional space, is this determinant form. So it looks like a three by three determinant. It's not exactly a three by three determinant because you've got vectors up here in the first row, I hat, j hat, and k hat. And the second row lists the components of u. So if u has components u1, u2, and u3, you list those. And then um, in the next row, the last row, you list the components of v. So we'll have v1, v2, and v3. Um, this is called the determinant form. of the cross product, and sometimes they're going to call it, they're going to say it's with cofactor expansion. And that's just a particular way of evaluating determinants in linear algebra. If you haven't had linear algebra yet, most of you haven't. Um, you don't have to worry about that too much. Um, so what we do is we're going to get a vector from this. To find the first component, you're going to cross out the row and column that contains i hat. So you're going to cross out this row and cross out this column, and you're going to be left with a 2 by 2. We're going to calculate that 2 by 2 determinant here. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And you multiply by i hat. And then you subtract the next one. The sign alternates, so we start positive, and then we subtract the next one. And to find the next term, or the next um, component of our cross product, we're going to cross out the row and column containing j hat. So cross out the top row, cross out that column, and you're still left with the u1 and u3, and v1 and v3. And you multiply that by j hat. Notice it goes positive, negative, the next one's positive. To find the z component, we cross out the row and column containing k hat. You're going to have u1, u2 in that first row, and v1, v2 in the second row, and you multiply by k hat. Now to evaluate each of these, I'm just evaluating it the way we evaluate a 2 by 2 determinant. It's very easy. So if I have a matrix with um, entries A, B, C, and D listed like this, to evaluate the 2 by 2 determinant, you just multiply A times D, and you subtract B times C. So that's what we're going to do here, and here, and here, and those are going to be the components of our cross product. So we'll have, I'm going to list it in component form now, uh, u2 times v3, or v sub 3, however you prefer, this times this, minus this times this. That's times i hat. And then we've got a negative 1 times u1 v3, minus u3 v1 times j hat plus u1 v2 minus u2 v1 times k hat. So we're right there, and that's the algebraic definition of the cross product. Um, so let's practice before we get into the geometric interpretation. Let's say I've got two vectors. One is 2, negative 3, 1. And the second vector is 
1, negative 2, 1. That's u and that's v. And we want to compute the cross product using this determinant form. So I write i hat, j hat, and k hat in the first row. List the components of u in the second row. List the components of v in the third. And you can write out the cofactor expansion every time if you want to. I don't tend to. I tend to do it in my head. Um, but just for example, I'm going to show that here. And then later, maybe as you get more comfortable, you can skip this step. Cross out the row and column containing i hat. Then we've got this 2 by 2. Take that 2 by 2 determinant, multiply it by i hat. Then subtract. Cross out the row and column containing j hat. You're left with a 2, 1, 1, 1. Multiply by j hat. Then add. We add, subtract, and then add. Multi or cross out the row and column containing k hat. And we're there. And then you just evaluate those 2 by 2 determinants. Just do some arithmetic. So we're going to have negative 3 times 1 is negative 3 minus a negative 2, so that's plus 2, times i hat, minus the quantity 2 minus 1 times j hat, plus negative 4, when I multiply, minus a negative 3. Be very careful about your signs here. It's very easy to just say, oh, minus 3, and then you'd have a, a minus 3 there rather than a neg subtracting a negative 3. Um, so just be very, very careful. I'm going to write it in component form. So I've got negative 1. That's 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. And then negative 4 plus 3 is also negative 1. Um, so that's our, that's our cross product. So that's u cross v. Or sometimes you'll see it written this way. u cross v is a single vector. The result is a vector. Now, if you are wondering what does all of this mean, don't worry, I'm about to tell you what all of this means. Um, here's our first uh, geometric interpretation. If I have two vectors and those two vectors aren't parallel to each other, let's say I've got u here and v here. Together, those create an entire plane. They define a plane, as long as they're not parallel to each other. If they're parallel, they define a line. If they're not parallel, they define a plane. There's some plane that contains u and v, and it turns out any vector that I multiply u by, that's also in the plane, because I can multiply uh, u by 1 half, and it's going to be smaller. I can multiply u by 10, it's going to be larger. Negative 10, it's going to be um, 10 times larger, but in the opposite direction. And v, I can do the same thing, multiply that by scalars, then if I add those together, I add a constant times u and a constant times v together, um, I am going to definitely end up with a vector in this plane. So this is actually a plane that contains all the vectors that are linear combinations of u and v. So I'm thinking of this as the plane um, that's defined by these two non-parallel vectors, u and v. Um, now it turns out that the cross product u cross v and v cross u are both perpendicular or orthogonal or we would say typically normal to the plane containing u and v. In linear algebra, you'll say that it's the plane spanned by u and v. Now, one of those vectors, u cross v, goes up and the other one goes down. Um, it turns out, and these, the, it looks like u and v are perpendicular to each other. They're not, not necessarily. They could be, there could be an acute angle between them or an obtuse angle between them. But u cross v 
or actually that vector u cross v, it's perpendicular to both of them. It's perpendicular to the entire plane that's spanned by those guys. And b cross u, it actually has the exact same length, but it's in the opposite direction. So I drew a dotted line because it's behind that plane or under that plane. This is the vector v cross u. Um, so if you're wondering, how did I know that u cross v went this way and v cross u went that way? Um, I knew because of something called the right-hand rule. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the right-hand rule, and then we're going to come back to these two vectors, u cross v and v cross u. But here's the most important geometric interpretation. These are both perpendicular to the plane that contains u and v. So if I want a vector that's perpendicular to that plane or normal to that plane, we say that vectors are normal to surfaces like planes, um, then one of these guys will suffice. That's exactly what I want. Um, so let's talk about the right-hand rule. The right-hand rule tells us which way u cross v goes. When I know that this vector u cross v is perpendicular to the plane containing u and v. I know it's either the one that points up from that plane or points down from that plane, um, given this picture. It's going to be on one side of the plane pointing one way, or it's going to be on the other side of the plane. To figure out which way it points, we're going to use the right-hand rule. It's actually very easy. So if you're trying to determine the way that u, the direction of u cross v, Point your fingers in the direction of the first vector. So point your fingers in the direction of u, and then you want to curl your fingers toward v. So let's say this is my vector u and this is my vector v. And I want to know, this is in the plane of the page. Does u cross v um, point out of the page? So it's pointing up toward us or into the page? So like into my desk below us. Well, to figure that out, um, I point my fingers. I use my right hand, of course. Let's, say, let's emphasize that. It's the right hand rule. So use your right hand. If you use your left hand, you will get the opposite of the right answer. Um, so use your right hand, point your fingers toward u. Now you want to curl your fingers toward v. Now my fingers automatically, from the way my hand is, is facing right now, my fingers automatically curl in the opposite direction. You don't have to like try to bend your fingers backwards. If you have to bend your fingers backwards, just flip your hand. So you point my fingers in the direction of u. Sorry, it's hard to, to see on this camera. And then curl them toward V. The direction your thumb points, that's where U cross V is. So U cross V goes into the page this time. And if I were doing V cross U, I point my fingers in the direction of V, curl them toward U, I go this way and then this way, and then my thumb points up. The direction your thumb points is the direction of the cross product. Um, so that was V cross U. So V cross U points out of the page. So if you're trying to do U cross V, use your right hand, point your fingers in the direction of U, curl your fingers toward V, then your thumb points in the direction of u cross v. Okay, that's one very important geometric interpretation. Um, u cross v and v cross u um, are both perpendicular to the plane that contains u and v. A cross product is always perpendicular to the plane that contains the two vectors that you started with. I keep saying the word perpendicular, but we should be using the word normal. Um, 
vectors and planes or vectors and surfaces, we say that they're normal to each other. But all we really mean is that they meet at 90 degree angle. Okay, um, so we've got that. We understand that idea. And I don't think I want to use the back side of that paper. Now it turns out you can prove this to yourself just using the algebraic definition. Um, U cross V and V cross U have the same magnitude and they're opposites of each other. And we just saw that. We saw that they pointed in opposite directions, but we didn't make it clear that they have exactly the same magnitude. It turns out that they do. So V cross U and U cross V are opposites. One points one way, the other one points the other way. Um, these vectors both have the same length in opposite direction. Opposite direction from each other. And it, of course, if you want to find the direction of one of them, use the right hand rule to find the direction of one of them. So that is a, a huge deal um, as far as significance is concerned. Here's U and V. They create a plane. The vector perpendicular to that plane is U cross V. And there's another one. It's V cross U. It goes the other way. Um, yeah. So now we know we know the those. Now there's also a geometric significance behind the magnitude of the cross product. And it's helpful if I look at a picture. Well, actually, first I'll just give you the formula for the magnitude of the cross product. The magnitude of U cross V, or the length, if we're just thinking geometrically, turns out to be the length of U times the length of V times the sine of the angle between the two vectors. You might say, that looks a lot, an awful lot like the dot product, and it does, um, but dot product has a cosine, cross product has a sine. Um, with this in mind, um, we can interpret this geometrically. So let's say this is our vector u, and this is the vector v. If I wanted, I could draw that vector u up here as well, and draw the vector v over here. And now I've got a parallelogram with u and v as adjacent sides. Theta is the angle between u and v. Do you see that the height of that parallelogram is just the magnitude of v times the sine of theta? I hope you do. Opposite. Um, theta in that triangle and V is the hypotenuse or yeah, the vector V is the hypotenuse. So we have the length of the vector V or the magnitude of V times sine of theta as the height. Um, the area of a cut parallelogram is just base times height and base is the length of U. So it turns out that the area of the parallelogram with U and V as adjacent sides Well, we know that that's base times height, which is the length of u times the length of v times the sine of the angle between them, or, well, that's the magnitude of the cross product. And I didn't prove that to you, I just told you that, that was true. So you might want to prove to yourself that that's true. Um, so this is another piece of geometric significance. This is not the cross product excel itself because the cross product is a vector, it's not a scalar. Uh, the direction of the cross product gives us a vector that's perpendicular to both u and v. But if I'm taking the length or the magnitude of the cross product, I get the area of the parallelogram with u and v as adjacent sides. Now, of course, instead of a parallelogram, I could choose to focus on this triangle. I'll just draw a third side here. Oops. 
you can imagine what the area of that triangle is. If this is the base, the height hasn't changed. The height is that same height from over there, but the area of a triangle is one half of the area of that parallelogram. Um, so the area of a triangle with u and v as adjacent sides is one half base times height. So I've got one half times the magnitude of u times the height, which is the magnitude of v times the sine of the angle between them. And just like I said before, that this triangle, that's half of this parallelogram over here. It's that half. Um, so the area of this triangle is, is half of, of that, or half of the magnitude of the cross product. We actually use this a lot later when we look at surface area of surfaces. We break them up into a bunch of little pieces that can be approximated by parallelograms, and then we find the area of each parallelogram using this formula. It's in a couple chapters. So if it seems like this is sort of an arbitrary, unnecessary definition, um, it's not. It's actually, it's very useful and allows us to um, find a lot of geometric quantities. Okay, so we've got all this. Um, now, the cross product also allows us to do one more thing. Actually, with this in mind, this, this picture really helps. Now, if u and v look like this, because the angle between them is very small, maybe it looks like my vectors have very small magnitude as well. Um, well, then that area is very small. And as theta gets closer and closer to zero, that parallelogram gets thinner and thinner. What if theta were zero? What if I had u pointing in this direction and v also pointing in the same direction? What's the area of the parallelogram made by that? You might say, Miss Townsend, there is no parallelogram, and you'd be absolutely right. Since there's no parallelogram, the area is zero. Um, so if u and v are parallel, then of course the magnitude of u cross v is going to be zero. It's a scalar, because if they're parallel, well, there is no area, there is no parallelogram. Um, and if the magnitude of a vector is a, the scalar zero, um, the only way that's going to happen, magnitude is, it's like length, it's, it's either positive or it's zero. The only way that happens is if the vector u cross v, or we could just write it as a single vector u cross v, is the zero vector. So now we've got another test for parallel vectors. Um, if u is parallel to v, when we learned about vectors earlier, we said, well, that just means that u is a constant times v for some constant c. And our c's are going to be real numbers. Here's another test. If u is parallel to v, um, it turns out that the cross product of those two vectors is the zero vector. Um, and I've said, if this, then this, but it also works the other way. If this is true, then this is true. And if this is true, then this is true. So maybe rather than saying if this, then this, let's say u is parallel to v is equivalent to that over there and is equivalent to that over there. This implies this, and this implies this. So if you get a cross product of zero, you know those vectors are parallel to each other. If you know the vectors are parallel to each other, you know that one vector is a constant times the other one, and its cross product is zero. So these are three different ways of saying the same thing. Now we've got another test for parallel vectors. And you can also just think about it geometrically using that formula. It's actually not really geometrically. You can also think of it using the formula. 
Well, when is that going to be zero? This is zero, provided that u and v aren't zero. This is zero when sine is zero, and sine of theta is zero at all the multiples of pi. Zero, pi, two pi, three pi, negative pi, negative two pi, negative three pi. So this is going to be zero when they're pointed in the same direction or when they're pointed in opposite directions. Two pi just sends up back over here. Three pi just sends up over there. So we've got zero, pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, or zero, negative pi, negative two pi, negative three pi, and so on. Um, so this is going to equal zero when sine of theta is zero, which means that theta equals zero or pi, or any multiple of pi. So that means if it's zero, the vectors u and v are pointed in the same direction. If the angle between the two vectors is pi, u is going one way, v is going the other way, but either way, we can't make a parallelogram out of that or that. So this area of the parallelogram is zero. Also, I can just plug in these values for theta and get zero. So there's a lot of different ways of looking at this. Um, but just know we've got another test for uh, parallel vectors. Now, there are quite a few applications of the cross product. I'm just going to show you my list right here and then in the next video we'll start going through the list and talking about how to work out these applications. Um, so we've already talked about a couple of them. We said if I want a vector that is normal to the plane containing both u and v, I can take the cross product. u cross v and v cross u are both going to be um, normal to that plane. I can also use cross product to determine if two vectors are parallel to each other. If the cross product of the vectors is the zero vector, they're parallel. Now, that's a lot of work. Um, if I looked at u and v and I saw that there were constant multiples of each other, I'd also know that they were parallel. So I probably wouldn't do this um, necessarily. Um, but if I were doing this for some other reason and I happened to get zero, I could immediately say, ah, oh, yes, that's insightful. Now I know those two vectors are parallel. Um, the area of a parallelogram with u and v as adjacent sides is the magnitude of that cross product, which is the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times the sine of the angle between them. The area of the triangle is just half the area of the parallelogram. So we get this. Um, we have a physics application, um, torque. Uh, it's the moment um, about a point due to a force acting on like a lever arm. We're going to talk more about that in another video. Um, we'll also show you, or I'll sh I will also show you um, how to find the distance between a plane and a line in three-dimensional space using the cross product. That's really uh, sort of a 12.5 topic, so we're going to do that later. And then we will use both dot product and cross product to call um, to come up with a formula of what's called a parallelopiped. And what that is, it's like, I'm thinking of a rectangular box, but instead of rectangles for each of the sides, it has parallelograms um, for sides. So you might have a vector u down here and a vector v over here. And that's going to make you a little parallelogram for the base. Draw another V, another V, another U back there. And then the there might be a third vector, W, that goes this way. And I could create parallelograms this way. So there's a V down there. So that must be a V there. And that was W over there. And you just keep going. And you get this polyhedron that has parallelograms on all the sides. Now it turns out that there is a formula for this, the volume of this, it's called a parallelopiped, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, that involves dot product and cross product. Um, so we'll do some applications of those in other videos. Um, yeah, I'll show you applications in the next video.